Well, good evening. Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to First Baptist Burnsville and our blue Christmas service. A couple of announcements to keep in mind as we move to this season. Christmas Eve candlelight service will be at 530. That's only three days away from tonight. And then Christmas Day, we will share a love feast together in the fellowship hall with hymns and coffee and love feast buns. So you don't want to miss that opportunity. The Blue Christmas services offer special recognition for the struggles that people may face during Advent and the Christmas seasons. It's a seasonal paradox, a time when we are supposed to feel hope, peace, joy, and love, and yet a time when you may have a deep depression or sadness. On this night, we remember all those for whom the holidays are not quite as joyful whatever the circumstance. Tonight also happens to align with the winter solstice, the longest night of the year, which is fitting for a service of consolation and reflection. Tonight's service is sponsored by the Stephen Ministry. The liturgist will be Stephen Leaders and Stephen Minister trainees. I encourage you to get to know them, make reference of their names as they appear in the worship guide. And if you feel like you may need to engage Stephen Ministry for a sadness or a depression or whatever it may be that you're going through, please reach out using the information in the worship guide. As we settle in tonight for our service, I would encourage you to take a deep breath. Maybe the deepest breath that you've taken all day. There are some words provided in your worship guide for silent meditation. Take a few moments as you listen to I wonder as I wander and ponder the words you find here. Welcome to worship.
Many in this season aren't ready to sing joy to the world. Whether this is the first holiday season without someone we love, or we are still hurting from previous loss or suffering, we gather this evening as darkness comes to worship God in the midst of mourning. We gather to shed tears if they come, to hold hands if they are available, and to join our voices with one another and our forebearers in the faith who still cry out, O oh Lord, how long? And so we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, comfort us and all who mourn this night. Give us strength to grieve as we must. Help us receive your healing in the midst of our pain and find new order after the chaos of loss. Through Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. Join me in the litany of sorrow. God, we light these candles to acknowledge our sorrows and to honor them because not everything is merry and bright. We harbor griefs and disappointments, and here in this sacred place, we are not afraid to name them. Hear our sadness, O oh God. Catch the tears of our neighbors. Receive all tears as prayers. Your mercy is like a gentle and listening ear, like a shoulder to cry on. We bring to you our struggles and our pain. Hear our sadness, O oh God. Catch the tears of our neighbors. Receive all tears as prayers. You came to bind up the brokenhearted. You are called the Great Counselor and the Prince of Peace. Your spirit is called the Comforter. By lighting these candles, we invite you into the brokenness and the pain. Hear our sadness, O oh God. Catch the tears of our neighbor. Receive all tears as prayer. you'll follow along in the lighting of the candles of Advent. The first candle we light is the candle of hope. As we light this candle, we remember those whom we have loved and lost. We pause to remember their names, their faces, their voices, the memories that bind us in this season. May God's eternal love surround them. The second candle we light is the candle of peace. We light this candle to redeem the pain of loss, the losses that are very important to us, part of our own selves. We pause to gather up the pain of the past and offer it to God asking that from God's hand, we receive the gift of peace. Refresh, restore, renew us, O oh God, and lead us into your future. The third candle we light is the candle of joy. As we light this candle, we remember ourselves during this season of Advent. We pause to remember the past weeks and months, the disbelief, the anger, the down times, the poignancy of reminiscing, the presence of joy in the hugs and handshakes of family and friends and all those who stand with us. 
we give thanks for the support we have known. Let us remember that dawn defeats the darkness, joy comes in daybreak of morning, and life overcomes death. The fourth candle we light is the candle of love. As we light this candle, we remember our faith and the gift of love, which the Christmas story offers us. We remember that God, who shares our life, promises, promises us a place and time of no more pain and suffering. Together, we celebrate the love shared amongst us. Let us remember the one who shows us the way, who brings the truth and bears the light of love in our lives. The fifth candle represents the coming incarnation of the Christ. In this moment of silence, we pause to remember this candle with its absence of light as a sign of waiting for a future that is yet unknown to us from which God beckons. By lighting these candles, we say that what is broken in us need not remain in the dark. Everything about us is welcome to your presence, O oh God even our hurts, our wounds, and our doubts. Hear our sadness, O oh God. Catch the tears of our neighbor. Receive all tears as prayer. By lighting these candles, we can physically see that we are not alone. The grief that feels so personal and lonely is a universal reality we share together. Hear our sadness, O oh God. Catch the tears of our neighbor. Receive all tears as prayer. Please pray with me. It's Christmas time, Lord, but not all is calm, not all is bright. As we've heard, today was the shortest day of the year, which means that there are more hours of darkness tonight than any other time throughout the year. Some of us feel like we've been plummeted into the center of the darkness with our hurts, with our pain, with our loss. We know, we feel, and we live it. Thank you for friends, for family, for those who care, that will hold our hands as we walk through the darkness. But I must say how much we need you. I pray that you will give us hope. Hope it's that at some point we may see the sunrise at the edge of the darkness, even if it's dim, even if it's cloudy. I pray that you will envelop us in your comfort, that you will fill us with your peace, 
that you will let us know of the intensity of your love for us. Thank you for giving us hope, for comfort, for peace, and for your intense love. But oh Lord, how I thank you for walking every step with us through the darkness, looking at the speck of light. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with me in the bleak midwinter, printed in your bulletin. <laughs> Thank you. 
may be seated. If you were all asked to describe all the different emotions that you felt in the last year, what would you say? You might say you felt fear or worry. Maybe you would recall moments of joy and wonder, or maybe disappointment and frustration. But even if you said all of these, I bet you'd still be overlooking a few more of the other ones. Brene Brown writes in her newest book, Atlas of the Heart, how we feel shapes our lives. But most of us have limited language, limited to describe what we're actually feeling. What emotion did you bring into this space tonight? I work as a hospital chaplain at a level one trauma in Tennessee. The emotion that most often gets elicited when I come into the room is one of fear and dread. Even in times when fear and dread may not even be appropriate, it comes with a territory of being a chaplain. I can see families seize up. I can see them begin looking around the room and I usually begin my spiel of I don't have any bad news. I respond to all of these calls. And yet sometimes we do bring bad news. Sometimes I know that I'm walking into a space that is so thick with sorrow. that is so covered with worry and anxiety and fear. I wonder what emotion you brought with you tonight. That's how the light gets in, as you see on the cover of your worship guide. We borrowed this phrase from a Leonard Cohen song entitled Anthem. And you have a little snippet there in your worship guide. Ring the bells that can still ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. A number of years ago, I began to be intrigued, to be pulled by the art of kintsugi. This is a Japanese practice that goes back to the 15th century. And the legend has, I'm not sure how apocryphal or how true this story is, but there was a Japanese shogun that had a priceless piece of ceramic. And as we're all prone to do with priceless pieces of ceramics, 
he was dropped and it hit the ground and it broke. And the Japanese shogun was so depressed by losing this priceless piece of ceramic. And just as he was about to take that broken dish and throw it away, there was an artist that saw what had happened. And the artist said, let, let me try something. And so he took that ceramic and he mixed an adhesive with fine metal, shavings of pure gold or silver or copper. And he made a paste that he then laid into the crack of that plate. And when the pieces were rejoined, there was a seam that was visible. Much like this. And the shocking thing that this artist found out when he took it back to the shogun was he had created a work of art held together with glue and fine metal whose value now surpassed that priceless piece of ceramic. The fact that it was broken and repaired made it more valuable than it ever had been in the first place. Isn't this kind of how grief works? I don't know if you're like me, but grief tends to rend and to separate. Grief puts cracks into things that I thought I had shorn up. That priceless piece of ceramic that I thought I had figured out in a safe place where it wouldn't get knocked. It could not ever fall. It falls. Ritual is the secret to healing. In a recent NPR interview, I think the show was Hidden Brain, the host talks to a researcher about the role of ritual. And he's actually talking about a firewalking ceremony that sounds so completely unimaginable. I almost couldn't even hang in there for the interview. But what this researcher came to find and understand is rituals are what keep us together. Rituals are those things that we instinctively do. We light candles. We gather when someone passes, we bring food, we sing songs, and we offer prayers. Your presence here tonight is part of a ritual, a ritual that seeks to draw out both grief and love. Because as Francis Weller writes, grief and love are sisters. They've been woven together since the beginning. Their kinship reminds us that there is no love that does not contain loss. And there is no loss that is not a reminder of the love that we carry for what we once held close.
The holidays can be a very difficult time for those who are grieving, those who have experienced loss. And the truth is, it really doesn't matter the magnitude of loss. Grief may feel just as life-changing for losing a loved one, losing a dear friend, losing a pet, or maybe just going through a transition where children are leaving the house Or you turn on the news and it seems like there's so much sorrow and it never can be enough love. Grief is that invitation to open up. The invitation to be broken and let the light shine through. What emotion did you bring into this space tonight? Here's a few things that may help you if you're struggling to cope during this season. One, acknowledge your feelings. It's okay not to be okay. You can be Christian and have depression. It does not mean you don't have enough faith. It's okay to be sad and to need space. Acknowledge your feelings and then seek support. Find a trusted group of friends a grief group, a Stephen minister, choir member, whomever it may be, seek support. Do not try to do this alone because it does not work. And you will not come out on the other side any better. Third, take care of yourself. Grieving is physically and emotionally draining. If this is a difficult time for you, find a friend to check in on you and make sure that, hey, have you eaten today? How are you sleeping? Get somebody to give you a call. And take the time to love yourself. Fourth, find ways to honor your loved one. It may be lighting a candle, which we will do in a few moments. It may be starting a tradition that you want to honor. Or maybe it's keeping a tradition alive something that this loved one had always championed or found meaningful. Find a way to honor whatever it is that you're grieving. And try it this year. And then finally, seek professional help. Some grief can't be solved by ourselves or good friends. Sometimes grief gets stuck and we need the help of professionals to move us through those difficult times. Reach out to a therapist. I promise you, it'll change your life. 
don't try to do this alone. And Lamott writes, hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, then the dawn will come. You wait, you watch, you don't give up. This Advent season is a time of waiting. It's a time of anticipation. And I don't know if you're like me, but waiting is not something I do well. But I've learned if I can stay with it long enough, if I can wait, then often what comes out of that time of unknowing so much more helpful than me trying to run through it and rush and just give up with. I've learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light. Things that have saved my life over and over again so that there really is only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. What emotion did you bring into this space with you this night? Will you allow others to come alongside you? What can we learn in the darkness together? Amen. Please join me in reading the call to confession. Generous and gracious God, we look to you for compassion and thank you for your presence this night. Overwhelmed by our burdens, we easily forget that you never leave us alone and that your steadfast love for us never falters. By coming together, we find assurance and comfort that we do not suffer this longest night alone. You have given us strength to live through this night. Turn us to reach out to those whose night is also long and Christmas blue. Grant that we may be your healing presence in their lives by bringing them your compassion and comfort that will assure us that we do not suffer alone. Amen.
beloved in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus the Christ was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene on the same day, sat with two disciples, and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is a table for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. The invitation is simple. Come and eat of the feast. Not a meal to nourish the body, but to feed the soul. We receive the bread and wine connected to the ages, to the saints of old who felt unworthy, to the seeker eager to know all about God, to the teenager who wonders what it's all about, to the child who eats with unburdened faith. Woven in this time, the hopes and the tears of generations. There is great joy here. No one is turned away, for God is the host. Consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine, and bless us at, as we receive them at this table, we may offer to you our faith and praise, that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may continue to be faithful in all things. In the strength that Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and give you thanks that you have called us your beloved. Amen. Tonight, Holy Communion will be celebrated via intention. You'll be invited to come on the sides of the sanctuary to receive communion at one of the two stations. Take the bread, dip it into the cup, be mindful of your fingers, eat it, as you leave communion, you're welcome to come to the table and light a candle for whatever emotion you brought into this space with you. If you need to light more than one, there are plenty. Once you light the candle, please return to your seat by the center aisle and try to keep silence during this moment. Everything is ready.
How's everyone been fed? Please pray with me. Oh God, light our way so we can join your world-changing mission. Cast before us a beacon of hope. Illumine the pathways to peace. Dispel despair by the dawn of joy. Draw us round the fire of your love. Set a star in the silent night like you did that first Christmas when seekers gathered and wide-eyed wonder before the nativity of compassion, before they had any inkling of how a single precious child would change their world and generations later change it still. Amen. As the choir is moving and before we speak a word of benediction and share one final song with you. I would encourage you to stay after the service and be sure and get a cup of wassail. You already had one or two, that is fine. There's plenty. There's homemade cookies. This is the ritual that we practice. Also, be sure and take an ornament with you. The ornaments are made by Joyce, painted and cared for, and hopefully serve as a reminder on your Christmas tree that the cracks are how the light gets in. Friends, hear these words of benediction. Go slow if you can, slower more slowly still. Friendly, dark, or fearsome, this is no place to break your neck by rushing, by running, by crashing into what you cannot see. Then again, it is true, different darks have different tasks. And if you have arrived here unawares, if you have come in peril or in pain, this might be no place you should dawdle. I don't know what these shadows ask of you, what they might hold that means you good or ill. It is not for me to reckon whether you should linger or you should leave. But this is what I can ask for you, that in the darkness there is a blessing, that in the shadows there be a welcome that in the night you be encompassed by the love that knows your name.